Hello, my name is Elliot Crane. I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist and a specialist in pediatric pain management, and I'm here to talk to you today about complex regional pain syndrome. Complex regional pain syndrome also goes by a couple of other terms, uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, reflex neurovascular dystrophy, uh, but the, cur the current terminology refers to it as complex regional pain syndrome. It's one of the pain syndromes that causes chronic pain in children, one of the most common causes of chronic pain in children. Let's talk first about pain and what chronic pain is before we talk specifically about complex regional pain syndrome. Pain is a process in which noxious stimuli cause nervous sensations in the body, and those nervous sensations are transmitted through the spinal cord up to the brain where there is conscious awareness of that adverse stimulus and then suffering and an emotional response to the noxious stimulus. Chronic pain is pain that persists for three months or more. Reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome is one of the forms of chronic pain in children uh, in that it exists for several months or years in a disabling fashion. Most individuals think about pain as a single entity, pain. But there's different kinds of pain. There is somatic pain, that is to say pain that comes from different parts of the body, the arms, the hands, the skin, the muscles, the bones. There's visceral pain, which is pain that comes from the organs, such as colitis causes colonic pain from inflammation and stretching of the nerves in the colon. But there's also a third category of pain, which is called neuropathic pain. And that's the kind of pain that complex regional pain syndrome is. Neuropathic pain is pain that has its origin in misfiring nerves. It is pain that is not necessarily associated with any discrete injury or inflammation or infection. And in fact, neuropathic pain often persists um, having been caused by an initial injury or inflammation or infection, but it persists for a long time after that inciting event has healed and is long gone. It occurs because of, of stimulation and sensitization of the nervous system. So the nerves continue to fire abnormally, communicating a message to the brain that there's something wrong out in the body when in fact the body has long since healed itself. And that's complex regional pain syndrome, and one of the mysteries of complex regional pain syndromes is why this occurs at all. Neuropathic pain is different than other sources of pain because its treatment is different and it responds in a unique fashion uh, to the different medications that we, we use to treat pain. In fact, complex regional pain syndrome and almost all other forms of neuropathic pain is uniquely resistant to the benefit from conventional painkillers or analgesics, such as the opioid class of analgesics and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory class of analgesics. So we have to begin to look at novel ways of treating complex regional pain syndrome that don't rely on our traditional methods for pain therapy. Complex regional pain syndrome in children typically occurs after a minor or a trivial injury or a minor surgery, such as a sprained ankle or a sprained wrist or a small operation on the foot or the hand. It's usually, in fact, almost always out in the distal extremity, though in more advanced cases, the pain can travel proximally to the trunk. Why does this occur? When pain begins because of an injury or a process in the body, such as inflammation or infection, nociceptive nerves, which are nerves that communicate pain information, become activated. These are largely C fibers and small A delta fibers uh, with minimal or no myelination. These fibers begin firing and communicating the presence of a problem out in the body uh, and communicating that information through the spinal cord. There follows a process of neuroinflammation in the spinal cord and also out in the periphery where the nerves 
that are firing begin to stimulate through an inflammatory process in the central nervous system, uh, activation of glial cells and other inflammatory cells, which, they them, which themselves begin to release neurotransmitters, communicating that pain uh, more distally and proximally in the, sp in the spinal cord, so that a larger area of the body begins to perceive the presence of pain. Now, in ordinary circumstances, as healing occurs, this process of nerve stimulation and neuroplasticity in the central nervous system calms down and involutes, and as healing occurs, ultimately stops. But in some individuals, and we don't know why this occurs in these individuals, the, prob the, the process in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system continues long after tissue healing has occurred. So their nerves continue to fire inappropriately, communicating a pain message up to the brain when in fact there is no longer any source of pain. The sprained ankle is no longer sprained, the broken bone is no longer broken, the burned skin is no longer burned. The inappropriate firing of these nerves, communicating a pain message up to the brain, continues for some time and is a self-perpetuating process in those individuals who seem to be susceptible to the development of complex regional pain syndrome. I like to think of the process as almost an epileptiform activity out in the peripheral nervous system, which parenthetically um, explains why anti-epileptic drugs are efficacious in this population to a certain extent. The nerves are firing spontaneously. These C fibers and A delta fibers are normally completely quiescent um, until a noxious stimulus occurs. But in patients with neuropathic pain, they're firing spontaneously. And as they fire spontaneously, and the information goes up to the central nervous system, that nervous activity in the, in the spinal cord engenders further um, activity in adjacent nerves in a self-perpetuating process. The nerves communicate neurotransmitters distally from the central nervous system, which spill out, out in the periphery, largely um, uh, amino, uh, uh, multi-amino acid proteins such as substance P, which signals inflammatory cells to come to the area, creating an inflammatory process out in the periphery, which is secondary and completely unrelated to the problem and the inflammatory process that occurred with the inciting injury. All of these factors of complex regional pain syndrome um, suggest possible treatments for, for it. But before we go into the management and treatment of complex regional pain syndrome, let's talk about some of the characteristics that are seen, that are seen clinically. As I said, complex regional pain syndrome typically follows a small and trivial injury, and that's particularly the case in children. In children, complex regional pain syndrome is far more common in a lower extremity than an upper extremity, whereas in adults, complex regional pain syndrome is much more common in the upper extremity. I don't believe this is because of any unique feature of CRPS in children compared to adults, but I think that's simply the result of what children are doing day by day compared to what adults are doing day by day. Children are more active in athletic activities, they're on the soccer fields, they're running around, and much more likely to sprain an ankle than they are to sprain a wrist during those activities, where adults are commonly walking around and might have a trip and fall and break their fall with their outstretched wrist and break their wrist or sprain their wrist leading to CRPS in that part of their body. Complex regional pain syndrome, for reasons we don't understand, is also, both in children and adults, far more common in females, with a ratio of 7 or 10 to 1 uh, females to males. While we don't know why this is the case, it does suggest something about the basic biology and the basic underlying, underlying etiology of complex regional pain syndrome. CRPS is also completely unknown in children below a certain age. It seems to begin to occur for the first time in life around the age of puberty. So it's very rare to see CRPS under the age of 10 or so and it becomes increasingly common as children progress through puberty into the teen years and then into young adulthood. 
It's safe to say, in fact, that CRPS has virtually never been reported under the age of seven or eight. There is one report in, that's been published in the literature many years ago of CRPS, so-called CRPS in a five-year-old, but a careful reading of that case report reveals that the characteristics described in that child bear little resemblance to CRPS at all and probably a completely different pathological process. So what are the characteristics that one sees in complex regional pain syndrome in children? The first and most profound thing that occurs in CRPS is that pain becomes spontaneous. So instead of, for example, in a sprained ankle in which pain is induced by movement of the ankle or weight bearing upon the ankle, CRPS pain is continuous and 24 hours a day without any stimulation. And the next and very profound abnormality and what makes CRPS unique and both easy to diagnose is the presence of the phenomenon that is called allodynia. Allodynia describes the occurrence of severe pain in response to a stimulus that ordinarily is completely painless. In the case of CRPS, the mere brushing of the skin with a light uh, object such as a, a brush or a cloth or a cotton ball will cause exquisite pain to the child. In fact, I like to tell people that I can diagnose CRPS over the telephone when I'm called by merely having the mother blow her breath against the child's limb. And if I can hear the child scream in the background when she blows against the limb as if she were blowing out a birthday candle, I know that that child has CRPS because there is virtually no other condition, no other disease process that can cause that kind of severe and exquisite pain in response to such a trivial stimulation. Allodynia is a very specific symptom of CRPS that exists in virtually 100% of cases. Then there are changes that can be observed both by parents and by the physician uh, during physical examination. There is usually uh, a degree of swelling of the, of the extremity in the area that's painful. The extremity has changes in perfusion so that it's cold to the touch and cyanotic or mottled in color because of the lack of blood flow. There's also oftentimes a movement disorder of the affected limb, so the child is unable to voluntarily wiggle the toes or move the fingers or flex or extend the wrist or the ankle voluntarily. Uh, it's almost as if the foot or the, an or the ankle or the hand is paralyzed or stuck. That is referred to as dystonia. And in addition to the stuck or inability to move the extremity, there's oftentimes a contracture of the extremity with, with tonic flexion of the fingers or the toes or uh, extension of the ankle in a true dystonic fashion. Finally, there also may be movement disorders so that in, when there's an attempt of the child to move the extremity, what one sees is something resembling clonus or episodes of spasm. So the um, characteristics of complex regional pain syndrome that are seen on physical examination of the child include sensory abnormalities, which are uh, determined by the presence of spontaneous, continuous pain, uh, and allodynia, by movement abnormalities, and finally by uh, perfusion abnormalities that can be seen as coldness of the extremity, modeling or discoloration of the extremity, uh, and swelling. Complex regional pain syndrome, when it presents, is virtually always unilateral. This is uh, something I mentioned because other pain syndromes in children present with bilateral abnormalities and pain of the extremities, but complex regional um, pain syndrome always initially presents as a unilateral pain syndrome. It can, over time, spread to the other extremity, even though that hadn't been injured, and it can, over time, spread proximally from the distal part of the extremity, more proximally to the knee or the hip, for example, if it starts in the foot. 
or the ankle. But initially, it's confined to the distal part of the extremity that was injured in the first place. Now, having mentioned the symptoms of complex regional pain syndrome that one normally sees, um, there are actually um, strict criteria for the diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome that are called the Budapest criteria because they were developed by the International Association for the Study of Pain in a meeting that was held in Budapest, Hungary, some years ago. And the Budapest criteria have been uh, modified and, and refined uh, since their original publication. Now, the Budapest criteria require that an ind individual uh, meets the diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome if they have abnormalities in sensory function, vascular function, motor function, and importantly, if the pain syndrome cannot be uh, attributed to any other diagnosis. Now, children um, may actually have early CRPS and not meet all the criteria of the Budapest criteria. And I mention this because the Budapest criteria's purpose was not for clinicians to diagnose CRPS in the clinic, but it was rather to restrict the entry of study subjects into randomized clinical trials um, so that only individuals who met the criteria and truly had the full-blown symptoms and uh, syndrome of CRPS would be enrolled in such a trial. So they're very strict criteria, but early cases of CRPS in children may not meet all the Budapest criteria. So what are the Budapest criteria? There needs to be spontaneous pain, and there needs to be sensory allodynia, as I mentioned previously. There are motor criteria, such as the dystonia that I mentioned, and also abnormal abnormalities in sweating. And then um, there are the vascular changes, of uh, changes in color from pink to blue, uh, changes in temperature with cold um, uh, skin compared to the uh, contralateral side. Usually we determine that a one degree difference in temperature is sig clinically significant. And, um, and, and swelling, and again, uh, the absence of any other alternative diagnosis. But just to reemphasize, the Budapest criteria are certainly useful for confirming the diagnosis of CRPS, but in early cases of children, um, the Budapest criteria may not be completely fulfilled. And one of the interesting things about being a pediatric pain physician is that we frequently see cases of CRPS in children within weeks, or sometimes a month or so, of the onset of symptoms. And that's very early in the course of CRPS, and it can be diagnosed um, early uh, in, in such a, a child's clinical, con clinical course um, because the syndrome that they present with is unlike any other. And the characteristics that I would describe would be these. First, there's usually a trivial injury. Second, there's usually immobilization of the extremity. And a typical story would be a child who sprains an ankle during a soccer game, goes to the emergency room, an x-ray is obtained, no fracture is seen, and the emergency room physician or the orthopedic surgeon at the time says, well, I don't see a fracture here, but let's cast you or immobilize your ankle in a splint just to be safe. There seems to be something that is unique about the process of immobilization that will trigger CRPS in susceptible individuals. The child is usually able to pinpoint in time a point at which the pain has changed from the typical pain of a sprained ankle to a neuropathic pain. The pain becomes in, in, increased, intense, allodynia occurs, uh, and the pain becomes spontaneous. Oftentimes at that point in time, the immobilization is released, the cast is removed, and then the rest of the symptoms of CRPS can be seen. Swelling, color changes, coldness of the extremity, and exquisite sensitivity to touch. In fact, the sensitivity to touch is usually so exquisite that the child is oftentimes unable to sleep with that limb under the bedsheet and will sleep with it on top of the bedsheet. Now, there's a whole number of secondary things that occur with complex regional pain syndrome that goes on for a number of weeks before it reaches medical attention that are important to think about as well. The pain, because it's continuing, it's spontaneous, it's 
almost always results in sleep disturbance. So the child has poor sleep, difficulty achieving sleep, awakens many times during the night, has daytime fatigue, and then secondary mood changes because of sleep deprivation. The child is often removed from social contexts of childhood. They're kept home from school because of their inability to ambulate, uh, because of the sensitivity of the foot and the fear that somebody will brush against their foot or step on their foot or brush against their arm during the course of the school day, and because the intense, unrelenting pain makes it impossible to concentrate on learning. That removal from their social context uh, creates problems with depression, uh, low self-esteem, and uh, that, of course, feeds back and further intensifies their perception of their pain. So then a vicious cycle occurs. The, um, it's usually at that point that the child comes to the awareness of the pediatrician, whose usual response is to take a child with a limb disorder such as this and send them to the orthopedic surgeon. Most pediatricians have not heard of complex regional pain syndromes, and the majority of pediatricians, even if they have heard of it, will never see a case during the course of their career. But it's not an uncommon thing for orthopedic surgeons to, to see, and orthopedic surgeons will then uh, typically diagnose it and refer to a specialist who's skilled at managing CRPS. That specialist may be a person such as myself, a pediatric pain specialist, or an anesthesiologist, it may also be a physiatrist, a PMNR specialist, a podiatrist. Uh, many podiatrists see P CRPS and are skilled at its management, and oftentimes a neurologist, who will also be typically familiar with CRPS from their training and will be able to initiate therapy. Now let's move on to the physical examination of the child with CRPS. The first thing is that the child will be obviously in distress and will report severe pain. And if one uses a Likert scale, as is often done in clinical circumstances, they will tell you the pain is 10 out of 10. You will look at the limb, and while it may appear somewhat abnormal, somewhat swollen, somewhat dusky or cyanotic, you'll wonder why the pain is so severe, and you'll even ask yourself, if the child is over-reporting or exaggerating or amplifying psychologically the pain that they're telling you that they have. Well, the truth is the pain is 10 out of 10. And frequently the appearance of the affected limb is not, does not seem to be proportionately abnormal to the amount of pain that the child has. But there, is truly, there are truly few syndromes or diseases of the human body that are as painful and as disabling as complex regional pain syndrome. This is parenthetically also a problem that, is, um, that occurs at, at the school where teachers and counselors may look at the limb and say, it doesn't look that bad, it's clearly not broken, it's not bleeding, it's not deformed, why are you telling us that the pain is as severe as it is? Why are you missing school? So it's very important uh, when beginning to examine the child to uh, believe them and take their word for the degree of pain that they have and be cognizant also that other individuals in their environment, in their world, may not be taking this degree of pain seriously. Now the physical examination will typically reveal the following. Um, going um, along with the report of the severity of pain, it's important to ask the child about the character of the pain, the characteristics. And the characteristics of the pain are typically burning in character. The limb will feel like it's on fire or with stimulation like it's on fire. The pain will be reported as very sharp pain as well, and oftentimes it will shoot from distally to proximally along the course of nerves. Secondly, the pain is not confined to any dermatomal distribution, and it's not confined to any peripheral nerve distribution. In fact, the pain and the abnormality is frequently in a stocking glove distribution. Now, traditionally, we've been told that stocking glove abnormalities of the body, whether it's paralysis or sensory abnormalities or what have you, are frequently psychiatric. They are frequently conversion disorders in nature. 
And that's not true with complex regional pain syndrome. The CRPS is typically uh, in a stocking glove distribution with um, a transition from abnormal to normal sensation uh, at some point in the limb. Um, the, the pain of CRPS will be characterized by three characteristics on the physical examination. There will be hyperalgesia, allodynia, and hyperpathia. What are those things? Hyperalgesia is pain which is exaggerated or intensified in response to a noxious stimulus. Typically in our hands that would be a pin. So as you test the limb going from proximal to distal, the child will feel the sensation of the pin prick and it will be noxious but not unpleasant or not um, very, very painful until you get to the region of CRPS in which it's extremely amplified and extremely painful. That is hyperalgesia, when a, a somewhat painful stimulus becomes extremely painful. There will be hyperpathia. In hyperpathia, the sensation of pain is exaggerated in its location. So the pinprick on the arm is felt as a pinprick until you get down to the abnormal area affected by CRPS, and at that point, the pinprick induces pain over a very wide area, for example, the entire dorsum of the hand, instead of in just the small, discrete area of the pin. And the third thing, as I mentioned, is allodynia. So that light touch, brushing the skin with a examination brush, for example, causes no pain in the normal part of the body, and then as one moves from distally to proximally to the area affected by CRPS, the uh, sensation of the brush or a tissue or a cotton swab on the skin is completely intolerable. There's no need to persist in, map in mapping out the entire area of allodynia. Once you've determined the presence of allodynia, there's no need to further torture the child. Swelling may be profound as you'll see in some of the photographs accompanying this talk, or it may be very, very subtle when you see it, uh, recognizable only by loss of the normal creases of the skin. The temperature will be colder in the affected limb than in the normal limb. Now you can feel the difference in temperature with, your, with the back of your hand, but that may be very painful and unpleasant for the child. So what we actually use in the clinic is a remote thermometer that uses a laser beam. This is not a medical device. You can get it from Amazon or any, any um, home store that sells barbecue equipment. It's actually a thermometer that you use for determining the temperature of your steak on the barbecue. But all it does is it reflects a laser beam off the skin and back and gives you a fairly accurate temperature to tenths of a degree. And anything, any temperature difference between the painful limb and the normal limb of a degree or more would be considered abnormal. And it's not unusual to see temperature differences of two or even three degrees in the limb with CRPS. The limb with CRPS will typically, but not always, be discolored. Sometimes in the early stages of CRPS, the discoloration of the limb is evanescent and comes and goes. And you can determine the presence of discoloration of the limb by asking the parent appropriate questions and not leading questions. I don't ask them, does the foot ever turn blue? But I ask them, does the foot ever look different than the other foot? Does it ever appear to have a different color? And typically they'll say yes, and then you can ask them, what color is it? And the typical answer will be purple or blue. Or you may be lucky enough to see the discoloration actually in the clinic uh, during your examination. But in early courses of CRPS, the color changes come and go depending on the position of the limb, more likely seen when the limb is dependent or more likely seen during periods of stress or anxiety of the child because it certainly does uh, reflect the child's emotional state. And finally, there will be a movement disorder of the limb in that the child usually, but not always, will have impaired ability to move the distal extremities, the toes or the fingers, uh, voluntarily. They may not be totally stuck or frozen, but their range of motion, on active range of motion, will almost always be much less than the opposite side. They will seem to be frozen, whether that's because the child is afraid of moving them because of the induced pain, or whether they're completely unable to move them is difficult to say, but not important to determine. The important thing is that when you ask them to contract, 
their toes or to spread their toes or to wiggle their ankle, they're unable to do it to the same extent that they can on the other side. And if the child meets those descriptions and doesn't have another obvious source of their pain, and what might another source be of the pain? Um, they don't have a, a disease of the foot. They don't have a cellulitis or an infection of the foot. They don't have another known peripheral neuropathy. They don't have heavy metal poisoning uh, or something like that. Uh, then complex regional pain syndrome is almost certainly the correct diagnosis. Now moving on to therapy of CRPS. CRPS is a chronic pain syndrome and there is no quick fix. The treatment for CRPS is intensive and it's time consuming and frequently takes along the lines of I would say six weeks to 18 weeks for results and regression of the symptoms of CRPS and then resolution if the child is lucky enough to have complete resolution. Let's talk a little bit first about um, whether they're going to be lucky or not. Generally speaking, the shorter time that the child has had CRPS, the easier it is to treat it and the more quickly it will, it will go away. And of course, that's true with many, many, if not most, human diseases. The second thing, which is, I think, profoundly true, is that the younger the child, the easier it is to treat, or I should say, more accurately, the better the prognosis is in terms of cure. On the other hand, because the treatment of CRPS itself is painful and difficult, um, treating younger children can be very, very challenging, as you'll learn in a second, because of the uh, difficulty in motivating them to do what they need to do. The older the child, conversely, the more likely that CRPS it's in some degree will be persistent or there, there will be some persistent sensory abnormality or that it will spread or that it will become recurrent. And we'll talk more about the prognosis and the outcomes after I tell you about the treatment. The treatment of CRPS is non-pharmacological, pharmacological, and psychological. Those are the three domains that are important. And of those three domains, the most important is the non-farm management of complex regional, regional pain syndrome. In fact, um, the, the primary treatment of CRPS is physical therapy. It is the foundation upon which the management is based. And it is possible to completely reverse and indeed to cure complex regional pain syndrome with physical and occupational therapy alone. I don't recommend it. <clears throat> there are programs in the country that will do that. But uh, I believe that the more humane approach to complex regional pain syndrome is to use pharmacology and sometimes nerve blocks to lessen the pain of CRPS. But I want to emphasize here that the pharmacology of treatment of CRPS and doing neurological blocks for CRPS is not curative. It's palliative, and it's useful only in as much as it facilitates physical therapy. Physical therapy is what's important, and one cannot reverse complex regional pain syndrome without it. Psychotherapy is probably the second most important thing after physical therapy. Many, many children with complex regional pain syndrome have psychiatric comorbidities. About half, in fact, will have pre-existing anxiety disorders or depression, ADHD, OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Those are the most common psychiatric diagnoses that occur in children with complex regional pain syndrome. And the CRPS is not caused by the psychiatric disorder, and neither is the psychiatric disorder caused by the CRPS, but they're truly comorbid. I think there's something about the um, the biochemistry, the neurochemistry of some of these uh, conditions, particularly anxiety disorders, and the neurochemistry of complex regional pain syndrome that are related and co-occur in the same individual. But so psychotherapy is very important and psychiatric management is very important to treat any 
pre-existing or coincident psychiatric diagnoses, but also psychological therapy, CBT, uh, is very, very important for coaching, restoring self-esteem, and giving the child the skills that they need in order to complete the physical therapy, which is the curative element. And as I mentioned, pharmacotherapy is only useful in as much as it supports the physical therapy, which is painful and stressful, and also the psychotherapy. Now let's talk about the pharmacologic management of complex regional pain syndrome. I want to emphasize at the outset that opioids are inappropriate in the management of complex regional pain syndrome. Many times you'll see a child who's already been on opioids, or perhaps you've put them on opioids, not knowing the child has CRPS, which is not um, an uncommon or even an inappropriate thing to do. But once the diagnosis of CRPS has been established, opioids should be tapered and discontinued as soon as possible. Why? Because neuropathic pain is notoriously resistant to opioid analgesia. The opioid doses required to treat neuropathic pain are so large that they themselves almost always cause disability. They cause depression, lethargy, oversedation, and an inability to motivate the, the, uh, the patient to get off the couch, to get out of bed, and to participate in physical therapy. So the doses of opioids required to blunt the pain of neuropathic pain are such that they actually decrease the likelihood of succeeding in treating CRPS. Not to mention the panoply of side effects that are associated with opioids, constipation, nausea, dizziness, et cetera, and the predilection to physical dependence. So we choose not to treat with opioids at the onset, and if a child comes to us on opioids, our first priority is to taper and discontinue them as quickly as we may. Similarly, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are notoriously ineffective in treating neuropathic pain. If there's an underlying injury that still exists, a sprained ankle or a broken bone, for example, of course, it'll be useful for that. But for the pain of CRPS, NSAIDs, and the coxib, celecoxib, uh, are ineffective. So there's no reason to push on that. The medications that are useful for management of complex regional pain syndrome are drugs that are typically not used for analgesia. And they co they're, they're in two primary classes, the anti-epileptic drugs, particularly gabapentin or Neurontin, and pregabalin or Lyrica, and the antidepressants. And in the antidepressant class, uh, the effective antidepressants are the tricyclic antidepressants, which of course are rarely used these days for the treatment of depression, and the SNRIs, the selective norepinephrine and um, uh, norepinephrine uh, and serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, such as venlafaxine, which is also known as Effexor, and duloxetine, which is also known as Cymbalta. Interestingly, the SSRIs, um, Lexapro, Prozac, Celexa, etc., are completely ineffective in the management of pain. The most common class of drugs that are used are, are the tricyclic antidepressants, and of those, amitriptyline and nortriptyline are the most effective. I usually will start with amitriptyline, um, largely because of the side effects, which I find desirable, which are to say uh, sedation. It's given once a day at bedtime, and because Children with complex regional pain syndrome are poor sleepers because of the existence of pain and sensitivity of the limb. Uh, their pain um, can be tamped down and their sleep can be deepened um, with amitriptyline or nortriptyline and their sleep deprivation can be at least partly ameliorated by the use of that medication. Gabapentin and pregabalin are two calcium channel anti-epileptic drugs, which are unique amongst the other anti-epileptic drugs in the management of pain in providing analgesia. Here I'll go back to my statement that I like to think of complex regional pain syndrome as rather an epileptiform phenomenon out in the peripheral nervous system and also in the spinal cord, where these uh, pain fibers that I mentioned, A delta and C fibers, are spontaneously generating electrical impulses inappropriately without the stimulus to produce electrical impulses. Very much the same as in the brain in epilepsy, 
cortical neurons are firing spontaneously without any particular reason for firing in a, in a very disorganized ma manner. And anti-epileptic drugs are effective uh, for neuropathic pain syndromes because they decrease the spontaneous firing of the peripheral neurons in the same way that they decrease the spontaneous firing of cortical neuro neurons in treating epilepsy. So the, the neurophysiologic studies have shown that the anti-epileptic drugs, gabapentin and pregabalin, both decrease spontaneous discharges in peripheral nerves and also raise the threshold for other for induced discharge. So they're very effective and they can be started at low dose and the doses can be moved up to the therapeutic range rather rapidly. So those are the two drugs and drug classes that are the mainstays of the pharmacology of complex regional pain syndrome. In addition to those, there are some drugs that I would, I would consider to be adjuvants and somewhat useful, including clonidine, which acts at mu opioid receptors in the spinal cord, but without the, um, without the downside of uh, side effects and physical dependency of using opioids. And clonidine is also useful at bedtime because it's highly sedating uh, and does not result in respiratory depression. So it can be very useful at bedtime also to help induce sleep in patients who are sleep deprived and have sleep disorders because of their pain syndrome. Finally, there are other drugs that are used in select circumstances, most notably ketamine, um, which is a controversial drug. Ketamine you'll know as a sedative drug, a general anesthetic intravenous drug, and also a drug which has found recreational use on the street. Um, but it has profound analgesic properties. It also is uniquely um, effective in treating neuropathic pain, and it seems to be effective at decreasing the central nervous system overactivation that occurs in neuropathic pain syndromes. And we use ketamine continuously in very low subhypnotic doses, that is to say doses that don't induce sedation or sleep, in the hospital setting under monitored conditions for several days to two weeks or so to um, uh, reduce the pain of complex regionalist pain syndrome. It's also useful in reducing depression and in facilitating in the hospital setting the physical therapy that the child needs to truly reverse complex regional pain syndrome. But here I would emphasize that ketamine is not a first or second or even third line drug, but is a drug that we, we, we rely upon when we're facing treatment failure with our more conventional therapies. Also, speaking of pharmacologic management of complex regional pain syndrome, there is some use for an anesthesiologist or a pain physician to perform nerve blocks. Nerve blocks themselves are not curative. They're probably not even themselves therapeutic. But sometimes it's very useful to provide a continuous catheter-based nerve block of one of the major peripheral nerves in the limb. Uh, in the lower extremity, that would most often be the sciatic nerve. In the upper extremity, that would most often be a brachial plexus block. Simply to um, anesthetize the limb, reduce pain, again, in order to facilitate physical therapy in the patient who cannot, without the nerve block, tolerate the intensive degree of physical therapy and remobilization that is necessary to reverse complex regional pain syndrome. Psychotherapy, as I mentioned, is very, very important. All of the patients that we see with complex regional pain syndrome get an automatic psycho, um, psychology uh, evaluation and, in select circumstances, a consultation by a child psychiatrist. The child psychiatry consultation is useful in the establishment of DSM diagnoses of depression, anxiety, OCD, et cetera, as I mentioned before, and to initiate appropriate psychopharmacology for one of those syndromes, particularly if that diagnosis is impairing the ability of the child to tolerate physical therapy. Also, our psychiatry uh, consultations are very useful in helping us deal with sleep disorder if there's a significant sleep disorder that does not resolve with more conservative measures such as with the use of amitriptyline and a night dose of gabapentin or pregabalin. Now let me come back to physical therapy 
Physical therapy, as I said, is the foundation upon which the management of CRPS is based. And to repeat myself, uh, one cannot treat complex regional pain syndrome without physical therapy. The goal of physical therapy is remobilization of the limb. There seems to be something unique about the immobilization of a limb that leads to a predilection to develop, the, to develop CRPS. In fact, there are human studies that have shown that even normal individuals who have a limb immobilized in a plaster or fiberglass cast for six weeks will have some elements of complex regional pain syndrome when the cast is removed. This was a study that was done with medical student volunteers in Sweden. It's interesting, when one removes a cast, and if you've ever had a limb casted, you'll know what I'm talking about, um, one sees dystrophic changes in the skin, which occurs with advanced cases of CRPS, increased hair growth, which occurs in advanced cases of CRPS, and skin sensitivity and spontaneous pain, and a difficulty with moving the joints that were immobilized. These are all subtle symptoms of CRPS in that immobilized limb, and fortunately in all the medical students that were studied, it was rapidly reversible when they started to move their limb again. It's a mystery why some children who have their limb immobilized develop CRPS. In my view, there's probably a genetic disposition, predisposition to developing CRPS. But because immobilization often leads to CRPS, the flip side of that coin is that remobilization helps reverse the symptoms of CRPS. The other thing that occurs with CRPS is allodynia, the sensitivity of the skin. The amplifier, if you will, in the, in the central nervous system has been turned way up. So that light touch and trivial stimulation of the skin or the muscle beneath the skin in CRPS leads to exquisite 10 out of 10 pain. Why does that do that? Because the threshold for pain fibers to fire off in the periphery has been lowered. Partly we're going to correct that with anti-epileptic drugs, as I mentioned. And the mechanisms in the spinal cord that attenuate pain sensations are no longer working. And in fact, pain sensations in the spinal cord are being am amplified physiologically. That amplification can be reversed and de-amplified and sensation will return to normal by progressive stimulation of the painful extremity. We call this desensitization. And it's done multiple times a day by simply stimulating this, that hypersensitive part of the body over and over again, which of course is going to be very painful to the child. But the more one stimulates it, the more one turns down the amplification until ultimately, after weeks of daily desensitization, the sensation returns to normal. So the, the elements that are important in the management of CRPS are physical therapy, the goals of which are to remobilize the affected limb, and in the case of lower extremities, to restore weight bearing and ambulation in a slow graduated fashion, and finally, desensitization, which is usually done by occupational therapists, progressive desensitization of the limb over and over and over again, six times a day, using progressively more noxious stimuli, stimuli such as starting perhaps with a cotton ball on week one and moving up to week 10, it might be using a very rough texture like a Turkish towel that has been dried without fabric softener. These methods alone will reverse CRPS and restore normalcy to almost all children. The best prognosis, as I said before, are, ch are younger children and, as I didn't say before, are males. The prognosis declines progressively as one moves through adolescent years into young adulthood, so that about 10% uh, of males who are teenagers and as many as 30 to 50% of girls, of females, who are teenagers and young adults will not completely resolve their complex regional pain syndrome, and but be left with some persistent residual pain, but ideally no persistent residual inability to function. Also, in about one-third of females and in about one out of 10 or one out of 20 males, complex regional pain syndrome may be recurrent which leads us to the question of what to do with a patient with complex regional pain syndrome when therapy is complete.
when the pain has resolved, or when the pain has resolved as much as one determines it will resolve after 12 or 18 weeks of intensive physical therapy and occupational therapy, etc., what does one do with the child? It's not appropriate to put the child in a bubble or to treat them as a china doll, but we return our children to completely normal activity, which means re-entry full-time into school and back into athletic activities in spite of the fact that we know that a small percentage of these children may have recurrent CRPS. Nevertheless, we want them to um, have a normal childhood and be restored perfectly to function. Now, if they do have a recurrence of CRPS with their next trivial sprain or injury, or perhaps with an upcoming surgery, there are a couple of important things that can be done um, that the parents will already know about. So first of all, they'll recognize the signs and symptoms of CRPS on day one or two when they occur, and not on day 30 or day 60, and hopefully so will the primary care physician who saw the first episode of CRPS. And what that means is that um, the parents and the, and, the, and the primary care physician can jump right on those symptoms and immediately restore the management that was learned previously to be effective. And what do I mean by that? I mean before the, the, syn the syndrome progresses, um, they, will, they will start physical therapy right away. They will not immobilize the sprained ankle, but they will encourage weight bearing as much as possible on that ankle, for example. They will start occupational therapy and desensitization right away, and the primary care physician can also um, restart medications such as the tricyclic antidepressants or the SNRI and or the anti-epileptic drug on day one to reverse it. And my experience, reversal uh, occurs very rapidly in those circumstances and the CRPS will not progress. When surgery is anticipated electively or emergently on a limb with CR that may have a predilection to develop CRPS, and you know there's a predilection because of the previous occurrence with CRPS, an interesting medication that has been shown in a randomized clinical trial to be effective is vitamin C in preventing the development of CRPS. Vitamin C in adult doses of 1,000 milligrams a day taken before the surgery actually dramatically reduces the risk of developing CRPS in that affected operating, operated limb. Um, this, those can be simply scaled down by weight or body surface area in pediatrics so that for the small uh, school-aged child or teenager, 500 milligrams is probably adequate. And we continue the vitamin C therapy for at least two weeks after the surgical intervention. Other measures that can be used to prevent the development of CRPS in an operated limb um, can also be used, though there aren't randomized trials to show they're effective, they're logically used, such as the re-institution re of anti-epileptic drugs, such as pregabalin or, or gabapentin, perhaps the reintroduction of a tricyclic antidepressant, and also, and I think this is very important, the use of a regional nerve block on the um, operated limb, such as an epidural, a spinal, sciatic nerve block, a femoral nerve block, whatever is appropriate for the region of the surgery, to make that limb insensate um, so that the central nervous system is not stimulated to become hyperactive because of the surgical pain that's occurring. So let's summarize what I've told you about complex regional pain syndrome. It's a chronic pain syndrome in the category of neuropathic pain, which is to say that the pathology lies in the peripheral and the central nervous system and not, not out in the tissues of the body. The pain of complex regional pain syndrome is disabling and it's very, very severe. The symptoms and the signs of complex pain syndrome are unique. They're described in the Budapest criteria for diagnosing it. Though some children may not fulfill all the features of the Budapest criteria, they are still able to be diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome. Complex regional pain syndrome typically occurs after a trivial surgery or a, a minor surgery or a trivial injury that otherwise would not be expected to lead to a prolonged period of incapacity. And the treatment of complex regional pain syndrome revolves around physical therapy and occupational therapy. Everything else that we do in complex regional pain syndrome, we do only in as much as it supports efforts in PT and OT. And that includes, in order of importance, 
psychotherapy and psychopharmacology to address underlying mood and anxiety disorders or any other psychopathology that exists in the child, and uh, analgesics that fall in the category of the untraditional analgesics and not the conventional analgesics such as NSAIDs and opioids which we don't use in complex regional pain syndrome. And those analgesics that we do use are the, are the anti-epileptic drugs, particularly the calcium channel blocking drugs, gabapentin and pregabalin, as well as antidepressants in the TCA category and the SNRI category, but not SSRIs because they have no analgesic properties whatsoever because they don't affect norepinephrine reuptake in the central nervous system. The prognosis of complex regional pain syndrome is very good in children in distinction with the prognosis in adults, which is not nearly so good. The prognosis is best in younger children and in males and is worst in females and particularly older teenagers. As one progresses through the pubertal years and into the preteen years and the teenage years, the prognosis for complete recovery diminishes. But even in that population, we still get very good functional recovery and restoration of the ability to go to school and participate in most of the normal activities of daily living.